Part four of part second of Trilby. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jersey City Frankie. Trilby by George de Maurier. Part second. Part four. If our climate were such that we could go about without any clothes on, we probably should. In which case, although we should still murder and lie, and steal, and bear false witness against their neighbor, and break the Sabbath day, and take the Lord's name in vain, much deplorable wickedness of another kind would cease to exist for sheer lack of mystery, and Christianity would be relieved of its hardest task in this sinful world, and Venus Aphrodite, alias Azalgia, would have to go a-begging, along with the tailors and the dressmakers and bootmakers, and perhaps our bodies and limbs would be as those of the Theseus and Venus of Milo, who was no Venus except in good looks. At all events there would be no cunning, cruel deceptions, no artful taking in of artless inexperience, no unduly hurried waking up from love's young dream, no handing down to posterity of hidden ugliness and weakness, and worse. And also many a flower, now born to blush unseen, would be reclaimed from its desert, and suffered to hold its own, and flaunt away with the best in the inner garden of roses, and poor Miss Gale, the figure model, would be permitted to eke out her slender earnings by teaching calisthenics and deportment to the daughters of the British upper-middle class at Miss Pinkerton's Academy for Young Ladies, the Mall, Chiswick. And here let me humbly apologize to the casual reader for the length and possible irrelevancy of this digression, and for its subject. To those who may find matter for sincere disapprobation, or even grave offense in a thing that has always seemed to me so simple, so commonplace, as to be hardly worth talking or writing about, I can only plead sincerity equal to theirs, and as deep a love and reverence for the gracious, goodly shape that is God said to have made after his own image for inscrutable purposes of his own. Nor indeed am I pleading for such a subversive and revolutionary measure as the wholesale abolition of clothes, being the chilliest of mortals, and quite unlike Mr. Theseus, or Mr. Ilsus, either. Sometimes Trilby would bring her little brother to the studio, and the Place saint Antoine des Arts in his beau habits de pelix, his hair well curled and pomatumed, his hands and face well washed. He was a very engaging little mortal. The laird would fill his pockets full of Scotch goodies and paint him as a little Spaniard. In the Phil's du Toreador, a sweet little Spaniard with blue eyes and curly locks as light as tow, and a complexion of milk and roses, in singular and piquant contrast to his swarthy progenitors. Taffy would use him as an Indian club or dumbbell to the child's infinite delight, and swing him on the trapeze and teach him la box. And the sweetness and fun of his shrill, happy, infantile laughter, which was like an echo of Trilby's only an octave higher, so moved and touched and tickled one that Taffy had to look quite fierce so he might hide the strange delight of tenderness that somehow filled his manly bosom at the mere sound of it, lest little Billy and the laird should think him goody-goody. And the fiercer Taffy looked, the less this small mite was afraid of him. Little Billy made a beautiful watercolor sketch of him, just as he was, and gave it to Trilby, who gave it to Le Pierre Martin, who gave it to his wife, with strict instructions not to sell it as an old master. Alas, it is an old master now, and heaven only knows who has got it. Those were happy days for Trilby's little brother, happy days for Trilby, who was immensely fond of him and very proud, and the happiest day of all was when the Trois Angliques took Trilby and Ginot, for so the mite was called, to spend the Sunday in the woods at Moudon, and breakfast and dine at the Garde Champetres, swings, peep shows, donkey rides, shooting at a mark with crossbows and little pellets of clay, and smashing little plaster figures and winning macaroons, losing oneself in the beautiful forest, catching newts and tadpoles and young frogs, making music on merletons. Trilby singing Ben Bolt into a merletron was a thing to be remembered, whether one would or no. Trilby on this occasion came out in a new character, and Demoiselle, with a little black bonnet and a grey jacket of her own making. To look at, but for her loose, square-toed, heelless silk boots laced up to the inner side, she might have been the daughter of an English dean, until she undertook to teach the laird some favourite can-can steps. And then the laird himself, it must be admitted, no longer looked like the son of a worthy, God-fearing, Sabbath-keeping Scotch solicitor. This was after dinner, in the garden, at Le Loge de Guerre Champtre. Taffy and Junot, 
and little billy made the necessary music on their merletons and the dancing soon became general with plenty also to look on for the guard had many customers who dined there on summer sundays it is no exaggeration to say that chilby was far and away the belle of that particular ball and there have been worse balls in much finer company and far plainer women trilby lightly dancing the can-can there are can-cans and can-cans was a singularly gainly and seductive person at vera in six here again she was funny without being vulgar and for mere grace even in a can-can she was the forerunner of miss kate vaughan and for sheer fun the precursor of miss nelly farin and the laird trying to dance after her dong song le kong kong as he called it was too funny for words and if genuine popular success is a true test of humour no greater humorist ever danced a passiole what englishmen could do in france during the fifties and yet manage to preserve their self-respect and even the respect of their respectable french friends voila l'espice de horn car je suis said the laird every time he bowed in acknowledgment of the applause that greeted his performance of various solo steps of his own scotch reels and sword dancing that came in admirably then one fine day as a judgment on him no doubt the laird fell ill and the doctor had to be sent for and he ordered a nurse but chilby would hear of no nurses not even a sister of charity she did all the nursing herself and never slept a wink for three successive days and nights on the day the laird was out of all danger the delirium was past and the doctor found poor trilby fast asleep by the bedside madame venard at the bedroom door put her fingers to her lips and whispered quel bonheur il est suave même le docteur excuse il dit ses prières en anglais c'est brave gracon the good old doctor who didn't understand a word of english listened and heard the laird's voice weak and low but quite clear and full of heartfelt fervour intoning solemnly green herbs red peppers mussels saffron soles onions garlic roach and dace all these you eat at terrace tavern in that one dish of bouillabaisse ah mes caisses trays bien de ce ce brave jean home render gracious et quel comme quel quand le danger est passe très bien très bien septic and voltairean as he was and not the friend of prayer the good doctor was touched for he was old and therefore kind and tolerant and made allowances and afterwards he said such sweet things to trilby about it all and about her admirable care of his patient that she positively wept with delight like sweet alice with hair so brown whenever ben bolt gave her a smile all this sounds very goody-goody but it is true so it will be easily understood now that tra angliches came in time to feel for trilby quite a peculiar regard and looked forward with sorrowful forebodings to the day when this singular and pleasant little quartet would have to be broken up each of them to spread his wings and fly away on his own account and poor trilby to be left behind all by herself they would even frame little plans whereby she might better herself in life and avoid the many snares and pitfalls that would beset her lonely path in the quartier latin when they were gone Shelby never thought of such things as these she took short views of life and troubled herself about no morrows there was however one jarring figure in her little fool's paradise a baleful and most ominous figure that constantly crossed her path and came between her and the sun and threw its shadow over her and that was svengali he also was a frequent visitor at the studio in the place st antol where much was forgiven him for the sake of his music especially when he came with gecko and they made music together but it soon became apparent that they did not come there to play to the three anglishes it was to see trilby whom they both had taken it into their heads to adore each in a different fashion Gecko, with a humble, dog-like worship that expressed itself in mute, pathetic deference and looks of lowly self-deprecation, of apology for his own unworthy existence, and as though the only requital that he would ever dare to dream of were a word of decent politeness, a glance of tolerance or goodwill, a mere bone to a dog. Svengali was a bolder wooer. When he cringed, it was with a mock humility full of sardonic threats, when he was playful it was with a terrible playfulness like that of a cat with a mouse a weird ungainly cat and most unclean a sticky haunted long lean uncanny black spider cat if there is such an animal outside of a bad dream 
it was a great grievance to him that she had suffered from no more pains in her eyes she had but preferred to endure them rather than seek relief from him so he would playfully try to mesmerize her with his glance and sidle up nearer and nearer to her making passes and counterpasses with stern command in his eyes till she would shake and shiver and almost sicken with fear and all but feel the spell come over her as in a nightmare and rouse herself with a great effort and escape if Taffy were there, he would interfere with a friendly, Now then, old fellow, none of that, and a jolly slap on the back, which would make Svengali cough for an hour, and paralyze his mesmeric powers for a week. Svengali had a stroke of good fortune. He played at three grand concerts with Gecko, and had a well-deserved success. He even gave a concert of his own, which made a furor, and blossomed out into a beautiful and costly clothes of quite original color and shape and pattern so that people would turn round and stare at him in the street, a thing he loved. He felt his fortune was secure, and ran into debt with tailors, hatters, shoemakers, jewelers, but paid none of his old debts to his friends. His pockets were always full of printed slips, things that had been written about him in the papers, and he would read them aloud to everybody he knew, especially to Trilby, as she sat darning socks on the model throne while the fencing and boxing were in train and he would lay his fame and his fortune at her feet, on condition that she should share her life with him. Ah, Kimmel, Drilby, he would say. You don't know what it is to be a great pianist like me, Bien. What is your little Billy, with his stinking oil bladder, his sitting mum in his corner, his mall stick in his palate in one hand, and his twiddling little fooder pig's hairbrush in the other? What noise does he make? When his little fool of a picture is finished, he will send it to London, and they will hang it on a wall with a lot of others, all in a line, like recruits called out for inspection. And the yawning public will walk by in procession and inspect and say, Damn! Svengali will go to London himself. Ha ha! He will be all alone on a platform and play as nobody else can play, and hundreds of beautiful English yearnin will see and hear and go mad with love for him. Princessin, Comtessin, Serene English Altessin. They will soon lose their serenity and their highness when they hear Svengali. They will invite him to their palaces and pay him a thousand francs to play for them. And after, he will loll in the best armchair, and they will sit all round him on footstools and bring him tea and gin and kitchen and Marvin's glazes and lean over him and fan him, for he is tired after playing them for a thousand francs of Chopin. Ha ha ha! Now all about it, Heen! And he will not look at them even. He will look inward at his own dream. And his dream will be about Drilby. To lay his talent, his glory, his thousand francs at her beautiful white feet. Their stupid, big, fat, toe-headed, putty-nosed husbands will be mad with jealousy and long to box him. But they will be afraid. Ach, those beautiful Anclesis. They will think it an honor to mend his shirts, to sew buttons on his pantaloons to darn his socks, as you are doing now for that sacred imbecile of a Scotsman who is always trying to paint Toreadors, or that sweating, pig-headed bullock of an Englander who is always trying to get himself dirty and then to get himself clean again. Eh, de capo himmel! What big socks are those? What potato sacks? Look at your taffy! What is he good for but to bang great musicians on the back with his big bare paws? He finds that droll, the bullock! Look at your Frenchmen there, your damn conceited verfluche pig dogs of Frenchmen, Durin, Beerzil, Bouchardi. What can a Frenchman talk of, Heen? Only himself and run down everybody else. His vanity makes me sick. He always thinks the world is talking about him, the fool. He forgets that there is a fellow called Svengali for the world to talk about. I tell you, Drilby, it is about me the world is talking. Me and no one else. Me, me, me. Listen what they say in Le Figaro. Reads it. What do you think of that, eh? What would your durian say if people wrote of him like that? But you are not listening, sepperment, great big she-fool that you are, sheep's head, dumkoff, donnerwetter. You are looking at the chimney-pots when Svengali talks. Look a little lower down between the houses on the other side of the river. There is a little ugly great building there, and inside are eight slanting slabs of brass, all in a row, like beds in a school dormitory, and one fine day... You shall lie asleep on one of those slabs, you, Drilby, who would not listen to Svengali, and therefore lost him. And over the middle of you will be a little leather apron, and over your head a little brass tap. And all day long and all night the cold water shall trickle, 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 all the way down your beautiful white body, to your beautiful white feet till they turn green. And your poor, damp, draggly, muddy rags will hang above you from the ceiling for your friends to know you by. Drip. 
drip, drip, but you will have no friends. And people of all sorts, strangers, will stare at you through the big plate glass window. Englanders, chiffoniers, painters and sculptors, workmen, pui, pui, old hags of washerwomen, and say, Ah, what a beautiful woman was that! Look at her! She ought to be rolling in her carriage and pair. And just then, who should come by, rolling in his carriage and pair, smothered in furs and smoking a big cigar of Havana, but Svengali? Who will jump out and push the canali aside and say, Ha ha! That is the grand drilpy! who would not listen to Svengali, but looked at the chimney-pots when he told her of his manly love, and, Hey, damn it, Svengali, what the devil are you talking about to Trilby about? You're making her sick, can't you see? Leave off, and go to the piano, man, or I'll come and slap you on the back again. Thus would that sweating, pig-headed bullock of an Englander stop Svengali's love-making and release Trilby from bad quarters of an hour. Then Svengali, who had a wholesome dread of the pig-headed bullock, would go to the piano and make impossible discords and say, Dear Drilby, come and sing Pen Paul. I'm thirsting for those so beautiful chest notes. Come. Poor Trilby needed little pressing when she was asked to sing and would go through her lamentable performance to the great discomfort of little Billy. It lost nothing of its grotesqueness from Svengali's accompaniment, which was a triumph of cacophony, and he would encourage her, Trispin, Trispin, say yes. When it was over, Svengali would test her ear, as he called it, and strike the C in the middle, and then F, just above, and ask which was the highest. And she would declare they were both exactly the same. It was only when he struck a note in the bass and another in the treble that she could perceive any difference, and said that the first sounded like Perry Martin blowing up his wife, and the second like her little godson trying to make the peace between them. She was quite tone-deaf and didn't know it and he would pay her extravagant compliments on her musical talent, till Taffy would say, Look here, son, golly, let's hear you sing a song. And he would tickle him so masterfully under the ribs that the creature howled and became quite hysterical. Then Svengali would vent his love of teasing on little Billy, and pin his arms behind his back, and swing him round, saying, Himmel, what's this for an arm? It's like a girl's. It's strong enough to paint, said little Billy. And what's this for a leg? It's like a matchstick." stick. It's strong enough to kick if you don't leave off, said little Billy. The young and tender would let out his little heel and kick the German's shins, and just as the German was going to retaliate, Big Taffy would pin his arms and make him sing another song, much more discordant than Trilby's, for he didn't dream of kicking Taffy. Of that you may be sure. Such was Svengali, only to be endured for the sake of his music, always ready to vex, frighten, bully, or torment anyone or anything smaller and weaker than himself, from a woman or a child to a mouse or a fly. End of part second. Recording by Jersey City Frankie.